So last two weeks, we've been dealing with dark heritage. Um, we now move um, mode, if I can put it that way, into the world of cultural relativism as seen through classical eyes. So a major theme here is can we understand what I've been discussing with um, um, Giovanna a little bit about what she's going to be talking about. So can we, with a partially literate world, we have some access to writing, some non-access to writing, can we understand what violence means? To what extent is it engaged with the ritual? So that's the sort of cross-cultural, um, cultural relativistic theme. And then there are some nice links to later lectures, which I'll pick up on later. One is substitution of one body for another. This happened also further north in, in the Iron Age. And, and also, um, um, yeah, substitution, and then the other one, I forget what the other link is, <laughs> but anyway, we, this will become um, evidence as we move through the, the particular lecture. Anyway, the um, what I would like to do just very briefly is introduce Giovanna. We have a joint project um, between the University of Cambridge and um, the University of Milan, which is engaged with science at Tarquinium. And the idea is that we have a classical world which doesn't use science, that is archaeological science, quite as much as some other types of archaeology and so we have this complementary approach and this engages very much with what um, Giovanna is going to be talking about um, later um, today. So that's the sort of opening idea, discovering people who have suffered violent ends and employing archaeological science to see better what that is about. But rather than speak at great length, I'd like to introduce Giovanna herself. She is the Professor of Classical Archaeology at the University of Milan and is a, one of the leading experts of the Etruscans, particularly perceived through the site of Tarquinia. And so she is, luckily for me, and I, I hope for her, she is here all this term as a visiting scholar, visiting professor in, in Magdalen College, Cambridge, um, which is something I'd like to advertise to. There is this opportunity for future scholars to pick it up from outside um, Cambridge. And without, I forgot, I remember now what the other theme is, Severed heads is the other thing that we will see later lectures. Anyway, this is an opening gambit for Giovanna to speak about ritual violence in the classical world, particularly focused through the site of Tarquinia and the Etruscans, Romans, and Greeks. Giovanna. Thank you, Simon, for nice words, and thank you for inviting me here uh, in Cambridge uh, and for and to continue our co collaboration. So. And also thanks to Elena and Stanley uh, for organizing this, these seminars. Um, so uh, I will, as uh, Simon said, I will start with the reason why I'm here. Um, as uh, Simon said, um, everything starts from uh, Tarquinia. Tarquinia is um, one of the foremost uh, Etruscan cities uh, of Etruria. Uh, and um, uh, it is uh, roughly 100 kilometers north of Rome. Um, it is um, a UNESCO site, and the University of Milan is uh, excavating and doing research there since 1982. And we um, are on the site of the ancient city. Uh, the, the uh, necropolis is the uh, UNESCO site, and uh, it's a very important uh, necropolis because it is um, uh, the, the tombs are painted. So it, this is why it is a UNESCO site. Uh, instead, uh, the inhabited site is, uh, for from the archaeological point of view, is very uh, important because uh, it is completely free. We have no modern buildings. So the city is there under under the, the, the ground, uh, underground, and uh, the, the the site is roughly ninety uh, square kilometers. So it is quite huge, and uh, the University of Milano could uh, dig in uh, the uh, Ara della Regina uh, sanctuary, which is the largest largest uh, temple we have from the Etruscan. The mm, the dimension is the uh, roughly the same uh, of the Parthenon, to give you an idea. Uh, and the other site is um, the so-called uh, monumental complex, uh, which is the reason uh, from uh, 
why I am discussing violence, as you can as you will uh, understand in a minute. Uh, because um, uh, around um, a cavity, the first community of uh, Tarquinia uh, gathered at uh, the end of the 10th, beginning of the 9th century. And uh, mm, it, it, uh, this, uh, this site became the ancestral site uh, where uh, that was the focus of the old community. Um, our dig is now uh, roughly one quarter of an hectare. Uh, the cavity is in the center and all around the cavity, we found uh, votive pits uh, with uh, uh, animal remains. And also um, uh, we found uh, many, many um, uh, skeletons. So it is not a necropolis, it is a sanctuary. And um, this sanctuary was meant to celebrate uh, a, a natural uh, force that came out from the, from, uh, from the underground and uh, it was uh, worshipped for uh, 10 centuries. So we have a continuity of uh, worship of uh, 10 centuries. Um, all around the cavity we found where you find, you see the purple signs, 19 skeletons and all these skeletons uh, show uh, different kinds of trauma and different kinds of uh, of death. Uh, this is supported by the cooperation we have with the colleague at the University of Milano, who is a paleopathologist and a forensic. So the forensic dimension of our research is very, very important. Uh, and we are going through this, these analyses um, to understand the, the, the different uh, rituals that were uh, carried out in, in this time. And this, you can understand why I am obliged to study violence. Uh, I didn't expect to do that in my life, but the site really pulled me uh, to, to do this. Uh, I show you um, the, the, the the position of a seafarer, seafarer, we call him seafarer because of some uh, details of his ears and of uh, his feet, um, uh, who uh, was buried with this uh, piece of uh, geometric pottery. And probably it is an information we have to um, consider very carefully. Uh, giving um, an idea of the context and the relationship this person had uh, with um, Greeks, with uh, the Mediterranean, and the rest of uh, the ancient uh, world. Um, so this is um, this person, this uh, skeleton, was the subject of uh, a different um, publication we um, produced. Um, and I must say that uh, this uh, this cat this uh, this seafar so called seafar was the first uh, the first case we found in the Etruscan civilization. And when we found this uh, uh, person, this skeleton, um, there was um, a skeptic a skepticism uh, of um, for for this uh, discovery. But after this discovery, we started to have more evidence in Etruria. And uh, at, in, in uh, 2008, uh, in Rome, uh, there was a big uh, conference about uh, um, the position in, uh, human, in human skeletons in, um, in, in inhabited areas, not in tools, but in inhabited. Um, so uh, it is very important at this point, everything comes from science. So it, it is exactly what Simon said. And this is why uh, we have this coordinating research center in Milano, uh, where um, I cooperate, collaborate with uh, different departments 
of my university. And of course, uh, with uh, Simon, the University of Cambridge, with Science at Aquinia. And we had a conference last uh, September, and Simon presented uh, our uh, project. And, uh, and also with the Politecnico of Milan, uh, which is a fundamental, crucial uh, um, contribution uh, for um, dealing with this huge site and have um, uh, and have uh, the, the opportunity to to have a very good documentation a georeferential uh, georeferentiated uh, documentation so uh, the the um, the idea of uh, of this uh, coordinating re research center the, the, the the objective of this coordinating research center is uh, to support interpretation, of course. The idea is that uh, we have fragmentary archaeological remains, we have material evidence, but we don't know anything about uh, uh, behaviors um, and what is invisible from a certain point of view. And uh, we have the um, idea that the interpretation is really something very difficult to uh, support if you don't have a very uh, large span of uh, of information. So th this is just to give you an idea of our project, uh, and then uh, we go to um, the, the subject of my uh, of my seminar, um, which is uh, of course kind of a, a literary review. Uh, I today I want to work uh, to to discuss with you um, what we have from the uh, what help we have from the literary review and uh, um, what are the topics on which uh, scholars concentrated uh, over time so the quick the key uh, question of course uh, coming from Tarquinia um, is um, uh, how can we deal uh, with evidence of sacrificial uh, rituals First of all, in the classical world, and then in the Etruscan world. Why should, uh, am I dividing classical world and Etruscan world? Because the classical world has um, literary sources. Etruscans don't. Uh, so um, the, 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 very often uh, we do uh, use um, classical sources to explain Etruscan uh, problems. And this is um, now it, this uh, attitude it shows it, that it is torn away. I mean, it, it is something that we cannot do anymore. Uh, and this is why archaeology and science uh, applied to archaeology uh, is, is so important. But we have to face, uh, as I told you, uh, what has been done uh, in the classical uh, in the classical studies uh, about about violence uh, so the key question um, is uh, how, we, how we can uh, address the role of violence within ancient uh, sacrificial rituals uh, with today's eyes uh, violence and sacrifice bring many facets of humanity into play making it very difficult to delineate linear research paths there are many overlaps and interferences between research approaches and the research field. I plan to give a theoretical outline rather than uh, going into detail. Uh, so mine are just a few uh, reflections and I hope you have a discussion as I told you. Um, the term uh, violence, let's see what happens with classical texts. So, uh, the term uh, violence, uh, combined with sacrificial uh, ritual um, is very difficult. Uh, is very difficult to, to find. It is very difficult to find the two words associated in uh, classical uh, literature. It's not very difficult. It, it never happens. Uh, so this is the first point, and also the idea of sacrifice has been. Um, discussed in a very important uh, um, 
conference autour de la notion de Starker uh, that really gives the idea of uh, sacrifice Starker or as something that is set apart. So um, Latin. Um, so let's see. Let's go to through the term violence first. Uh, Greek uh, bia uh, is not only violent, it is also force. Uh, it is uh, harmful, it illegitimate aggression or a legitimate use of coercition. An example uh, we have is um, the rule of nomos, uh, the law is king over all, and Pindar says Heracles used bia to overcome injustice. So this is force, it's not violence. The Latin violentia has similar meaning and violence and aggressiveness uh, and also overwhelming force. So it's not uh, uh, violence as we uh, conceive, as we uh, call it and as we feel it today. It's force, first of all. And then uh, sacrificial rituals. Uh, let's go to uh, see what happens in Greek. The, the word tizia, burnt offering, uh, is the most common word for a sacrifice. And uh, it doesn't involve necessarily uh, animals. And it is always followed by a meal or meat taken from the victim. So it, is, um, it, it goes together. The Greek word spagia is the most uh, common, uh, uh, second most common word. Um, and it is um, slitting the throat of an animal victim. And this is not followed by a meal. Uh, so th th it's, it's a big difference. The Latin word sacrificium uh, is just, um, uh, it, it means not killing a victim but it means uh, setting apart. It means uh, that uh, something has been uh, separate from uh, the, the, the common wor world, the, the, no the normal living, and it is set apart. And the Latin word uh, immolatio means a sprinkling of meal. So it is um, something um, that is um it has another meeting um, meaning again um so if if we um as i told you if we want to find the violence combined uh, with sacrificial uh, rituals uh, we uh, we are without uh, indications so um, another problem that we are going to uh, meet uh, later on is uh, the word phonos. Phonos um, that is used in some late vegetarian texts. Usually phonos is translate, is translate like uh, with the word uh, killing, to kill. But instead phonos is not exactly, has not exactly that meaning because phonos means to strike. And this is something that we are, as we are, uh, we discuss later. Um, and in Latin also, violencia is something different from killing animals. What is um, um, really uh, important for us uh, is the terminology of, uh, uh, how the the victim the the the, the victim is uh, is uh, called the victim is called yereya yereya which has nothing to do with violence uh, or sacrifice yereya means uh, sacred uh, it is uh, similar mm -hmm. to the latin sacrificium so it is uh, something that that does not define uh, a victim. And it is something that is not connected to guilt. So this is 
uh, something that uh, is, in a way, it, it is the base of what I am going to present uh, today. So, just to sum up, uh, in Greek and Latin, we have no sense of violence and sacrifice. And what is the focus? If the focus is on sacrificial ritual. The animal is put to death during an act of worship. So this is um, what is uh, coming out uh, during in the last uh, in the last studies from Pharaoh and Naiden in 2012 and Naiden in 2020. So uh, let's say uh, why in some of the contemporary scholarship do the words violence and sacrifice form a likely pair? Uh, what is the origin of this? Why are we here at this point? Uh, it is better to go through the, um, the scholarship. Uh, Violent Origins is a book that has been uh, produced after a conference uh, uh, held in California um, in the 1880s. Uh, and it's kind of sum up um, what happened 50 years uh, ago when notions of sacrifice and violence were crucial and unavoidable for any research focused on the history of human beings and their cultures. Violence and sacrifice were part of a vivid debate between the German and the French school. Uh, first, uh, the first things that we are dealing with are Walter Burke and uh, René Girard. So the study of violent uh, sacrifice among the Greeks and Romans began once the scholarly subjects of ritual and sacrifice emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century. In the late 19th century, ritual became understood as a process of worship that influenced social life on the one and meat on the other, not only in Greek and Roman religion, but in religion in general. So three great uh, theories have dominated research on sacrifice in the ancient world during the second half of the past century. The theories of what Walter Burke, René Girard, and Jean-Pierre Bernard. Um, uh, Walter Burke, Burke um, strengthened uh, the idea of sacrificial uh, ritual uh, uh, that was performed with violence, uh, associating uh, sacrifice with the inborn uh, violent tendencies posited by the ethologist Conrad, Conrad Lawrence. So there was an interdisciplinary um, attitude. Uh, and thus emerged uh, the view that the Greeks and the Romans felt guilty about animal slaughter and that the ritual of sacrifice redirected or discharged this guilt in socially beneficial fashion. So these are very important uh, items that conditioned uh, studies uh, 50 years ago. In the same year, 1972, René Girard, who is um, um, a critical of, of he, he is a, a literary man. I mean, he studied um, um, novels, uh, uh, but it turned into violence and he proposed an evolutionary theory of culture and cultural crisis with religion and animal sacrifice at its very core. Religion is born from violence. This is uh, his, um, his, he focused on this. And um, the, the spiral of uh, the avenge could be stopped only through one final murder. So murder, in a way, uh, is the, the origin of, of uh, everything. But another murder is the end of, uh, of violence. Uh, so um, the other important uh, contribution is from Marcel Détienne and uh, Jean-Pierre Vernon. Uh, they proposed a revolt theory of sacrifice, which allowed that ritual was quintessentially violent and also allowed that the Greeks felt guilty about slaughtering animals. So they picked up from Burke. So the ancient worshipper 
ignore the violence around him for the sake of achieving social and political unity through communal acts of animal sacrifice. So again, violence is something that kind of unifies uh, with the sense of guilt, uh, with the sense of, um, of uh, uh, performing something that is uh, uh, not very well accepted by, by human beings. Uh, another scholar, an Italian scholar, Giorgio Agamben, went to completely to another um, path of, uh, of research. He, um, he is not interested in violence in rituals. He, he considers violent, uh, violent rituals for granted. Uh, sacrifice is important, but his interest is not in violence, uh, in uh, sacrifice, but uh, um, he considers uh, violence uh, as an instrument for the political um, building up a construction of, uh, of society. Uh, his focus is on homo sacre uh, and the situation of a creature uh, who is exposed in a way, he cannot be killed um, uh, to be sacrificed to the gods, but anyone, anyone can kill him. So it is something that is really in between uh, different, uh, different situations. Uh, but uh, Girard and Agamben uh, have uh, uh, the same attitude. Uh, because they focus on transforming the political by renewing its connection to religion. Both thinkers struggle to escape politics as defined by Carl Schmitt's friend-enemy distinction. Girard and Agamben uh, clash uh, ideologically, but their inquiries into sacrifice and messages take similar courses. So, so regarding origin, Girard argues for the sacrificial crisis as the common parent to religion and politics. In, uh, under, uh, it, uh, from, conversely, uh, Agamben, uh, through the uh, Roman figure uh, of Homo Sacer, uh, he, he, he comes to distinguishing um, politics from uh, religion. So this is to give an overview of um, the situation of that condition uh, all studies uh, since uh, the beginning of the 70s of last century. Now I want to see what happens with today's eyes, um, where the question is um, uh, that always the connection between violence uh, uh, and the sacrificial uh, ritual at this point. Um, if it is um, a modern construct, mm -hmm. our something that it, is, it belongs to our point of view, our perspective, and has nothing to do with the ancient the classical world. Uh, these books show um, the debate of the, la uh, of the late 20th century, uh, 20th century, the beginning of our millennium, um, when uh, this subject continue to be central to uh, general conceptions of Greek religion, and uh, violence became central to understanding sacrifice. Um, now, uh, uh, all this um, field of research met uh, with, uh, has met with uh, criticism. Uh, these books uh, um, are the books that I used uh, to uh, evaluate what happens uh, with today's eyes. Uh, so, uh, could evidence of sacrifices uh, perform according to written or unwritten rules show underlying, underlying regulations? Uh, it is difficult to assess the reasons of the choice of representations in iconography and texts. In theatre, tragedy has needs and accent different from those of comedy, and they could affect the visual representation. So this is another bias we have uh, when we deal with images, mm -hmm. because we don't know if these images uh, we have from the past 
are really representing directly something that happened or they were conditioned by um, by culture, the contemporary culture. So we can always uh, ask if the killing of the animal is the important factor of the product of the transformation into um, uh, the last location. We have graves, we have sanctuaries, so animals were killed, but were they always killed for uh, sacrificing purposes or were they killed uh, for other reasons? For example, in grave, when you have an animal in a, in a grave, can you say that this animal was sacrificed uh, for the grave or it was just an animal that was accompanying uh, the person who was buried? So we, we, we are not in the condition to understand this. So it's very open. Uh, and this is, uh, these questions are uh, put forward uh, by uh, the scholars uh, I have uh, put in the slide. Um, so with this, uh, in, this in mind, we can move to um, iconography. Okay, uh, we have uh, an important book by Tam Straten, um, who collected, uh, and it, this is the only book we have from the classical world, collecting in only one place all images connected to uh, sacrifice, uh, more than 700, roughly 700 images. Uh, that were uh, divided in a different in three different uh, categories. The pre-kill uh, category, uh, that means uh, pictures, animals uh, that are led to altars, processions. The killing, the moment of the killing, and the post-kill um, included not only butchering, but two other important topics. First, the inspection of entrails. And second, holocaustic sacrifices in which animals were burned um, whole rather than butchered. So the in-trail in, uh, in inspection is something very important because it's connected to divination, it's connected to prophecy, and it's, uh, it is quite shared in the classical world. Uh, the important... Uh, um, the uh, idea we, we get from the three categories is that the largest number of pictures are in the pre-kill category. They often show processions in which the animals are adorned with garlands uh, and the same as the worshippers. So uh, this could give the idea that uh, um, the killing is hidden because of guilt. But we, we will see that this is difficult to demonstrate. Um, also in, uh, uh, in Roman um, uh, iconography, um, um, we, we see that uh, um, Roman animal uh, sacrifice largely followed a scheme similar to the Greek rituals. So uh, the Romans, um, for the Romans, we cannot say uh, much uh, more uh, than what we know for, from the Greeks. So Roman, because uh, Roman religion uh, gradually came to incorporate ritual expressions from the Etruscans, first of all, the Greeks and the rest of the world known at the time. Um, and the foreign cults uh, brought into Rome uh, the use of animal sacrifice connected to the gods, the new gods that Rome in, incorporated. Uh, the, the Roman animal sacrifice was accomplished according to, uh, according to either the Ritus Romanus uh, with the head covered and the Ritus Grecus uh, with the bare head. And we have uh, processions of uh, animals uh, in many different uh, situations. Um, the most ancient sarcophagus uh, is that 
you, the one you find at the bottom of the slide, the author of Domitius Enobarbus. And Mario Torelli focused on this uh, um, and he produced a very interesting uh, essay connecting uh, the idea of procession, the way the procession is depicted, to how the Etruscan is. Uh, this is, uh, on, on top you see a sarcophagus from Perugia, the sarcophagus of the Sperandio necropolis, uh, where you see uh, the representation of, um, of um, a procession uh, in, um, in the situation of um, an animal sacrifice. Uh, which is exactly uh, what the, re uh, the Roman ke uh, kept, uh, picked up from the uh, Etruscan culture. In the Etruscan uh, the culture, uh, the representation of uh, uh, animal sacrifice is very often connected to um, the, uh, the manifestation of gods, um, gods uh, that are connected to the underground. Uh, you see the altar here uh, with um, a head coming out from, uh, from the altar. Uh, it's not very well preserved. Uh, it is here, but um, it shows how uh, it shows the connection uh, with the heads and the creatures that came from the underground and were directly uh, provided with the, the, the animal sacrifice. So this is um, uh, the general framework, the idea of guilt, the idea of hiding um, the, the, the sacrifice. And so instead of going into all details, uh, I prefer to uh, offer you uh, three case uh, uh, studies. We, we will go through uh, the, uh, the, um, big, uh, the idea of the victim's consent. Is there a victim's consent? Uh, uh, violence was uh, hidden, uh, and uh, if, as uh, Simon told us, um, can we consider um, that there was a substitution between animal and uh, uh, human beings? The first case study um, is uh, uh, I mm, I moved from uh, um, a recent article. Uh, of Stella Georguri, uh, who was one of uh, the scholars who um, produced a publication um, focused on the victim's consent uh, because she was connected to the Bernard and uh, Detienne's uh, uh, theories. But Stella Georguri changed her mind. Um, uh, and showed that texts are rare, late, and influenced by Pythagoreanism. The animal trembling when sprinkled with water is not giving its consent, but that of the gods who have chosen the animal. Above all, oxen resist constraint and struggle. Um, Strabo and Pausanias uh, report. Um, that um, the animal, the, uh, the, the an animal uh, which trembles, uh, is not uh, giving its uh, consent, but it is it is giving the consent of the gods. The gods are accepting the animal. So this is to give you uh, the idea of um, how the interpretation uh, changed over time. So we started from an idea, the same scholar started from, with an idea, and then in uh, uh, course, in due course, um, the idea completely uh, changed. Uh, of course, uh, putting in parallel different sources, texts, and iconography. Then uh, we have a, a second case study, uh, the idea of hiding uh, violence to avoid uh, guilt. No term belonging to the vocabulary of Greek sacrifice conveys the idea of victimization, constraint of the animal, and human guilt. 
The reverse of the fact that sacrificial animals are yereia, as I showed you, I told you before, is that they are not victims. The meaning of phonos is strike. Pausanias calls the priest butupos, <coughs> bus, uh, ox, and tutto, a verb that means strike a blow. The translation, the translation buffonia with murder of the ox has been uh, then revised. So buffonia uh, is not uh, centered on uh, uh, murder. Um, so uh, Burkett's uh, idea of concealment of violence produced by guilt, hiding the knife under the barley grains within the basket until the crucial moment of the killing uh, comes, has been contested. This is a, another uh, topic that was uh, very common, the hiding of the knife, the makaira, um, and all instrument giving uh, death uh, is not uh, supportable anymore. Uh, we have uh, uh, painting vases, uh, painted vases, we have reliefs uh, showing that the, the, the knife uh, is transported to the site of sacrifice and there, there is no sign of concealment. It can be placed in the basket after the procession takes place, and it can be head exhibited during the procession. So um, the effect of this criticism was to reduce Burkett's fundamental notion of guilty worshippers and victimized animals to its narrow literary and uh, intellectual basis. Vegetarian sympathy for victimized animals in Greek and Latin literature from, uh, uh, is from Empedocles to Porphy, so late, uh, late uh, writers. So this literature is mostly philosophical and ancient feelings of guilt about uh, animal sacrifice prove the, to be mostly a topic of, in intellectual history. So it is a perspective. It is something that uh, we have to uh, discuss. Uh, case study three, uh, su substitution of whom? Um, it is another important uh, topic. Uh, if the, the animal is a substitute, uh, is, it, is it a substitute of what? Correspondence between victim and receiver. This is, could be a first topic. Iphigenia uh, was sacrificed uh, to Poseidon, but she was saved by Artemis. All sacrifices in Iliad 3 uh, show that the sun and earth uh, received lambs, but the sun um, had. Um, white and male, uh, a white and male lamb, while Earth's Earth had a black uh, female lamb. And goddesses uh, are often associated with growth, uh, of, associated with growth, uh, could receive pregnant victims. Uh, there could be a symbolic equation of the victim with the sacrificer, uh, but uh, this uh, has never been heard of. Uh, if a sacrificial animal, like a priest, must be um, whole and perfect, that is not because the animal figures the priest, but because both must imitate a best, as best they can the perfection of the gods. So this is another, uh, another idea that came out recently. Sacrifice before the battle seems to parallel animal sacrifices. Resemblance between the myths telling of pre-battle human sacrifice and the actual pre-battle sacrifice of historical time are uh, to be discussed. The many myths of humans torn apart in the cult of Dionysus are likewise based on the actual treatment of animals. So the, there is this uh, parallelization uh, between animal and uh, human beings. Um, 
let's go to the sacrifices of the Spagion type, the, the second type of uh, sacrifice I uh, talked to, talk to you about. Uh, homicide for purification or sacrifice, pre battle sacrifices. According to Dillon and Parker, uh, sacrifices of the Spagion type are not followed by, since they are not followed by a banquet, uh, are for divination purposes. The idea of an equivalence of animal and man should not be struck off the list of meanings entirely, but it comes fairly low down that list, and it is relevant only in relation to a restricted range of sacrifice. Um, however, um, uh, within Greek uh, studies, uh, the possibility of uh, animal-human equivalence is per per uh, per per pervasive but in, in birth, Burkett's uh, Homo Nicans. There are indeed some Greek myths in which the idea of an animal being substituted for a human victim becomes explicit. For example, Iphigenia. I already told you. Was it a typical Greek sacrifice perceived at any level as a mitigated human sacrifice? Was it incidental? This is an um, important uh, debate. Uh, because um, we um, we have um, scholars that refuse the idea uh, generally for the Greek word they they refuse the idea of uh, human sacrifice because uh, we actually have uh, no um, literary sources speaking of uh, human sacrifice uh, for the Greek word. In Etruria, of course, I told you, we have no literary sources, but we have to face um, the situation of uh, mm, uh, trauma, trauma uh, like we have in the Civita uh, of Tarquina. So uh, this is uh, an important uh, uh, debate, uh, which is the, the, the evidence we have from Tarquinia is really clashing with the theories uh, about uh, the Etruscans. And now I want to go to a specific case, a case of Iphigenia. Iphigenia in, in, the, in Greek pottery uh, is uh, represented uh, while, in, in Greek pottery, yes, uh, is represented uh, while she is going to sacrifice. Uh, the moment in which she, she, uh, she is going to be sacrificed and Artemis substitutes her with uh, an animal. The same myth uh, in uh, Etruscan earth. Uh, this is uh, from the comparative uh, point of view is quite challenging uh, because we have um, a representation. Uh, this is um, something that has been studied by Bonfante. Um, uh, the uh, the urn, an uh, urn from Chiusi of the third century BC. Uh, we have um, the representation of Iphigenia, who is uh, recognizing her brother Oreste, uh, in Tauris. In Tauris, where um, uh, sources, Herodotus, um, uh, refers to, to the Taurians uh, as uh, headhunters and who practice the uh, human sacrifice. The representation of uh, Iphigenia in Tauris, recognizing her brother here, is quite striking because you see there are two heads, severed heads here on top. And these heads have fillets, exactly as um, the, the animals uh, uh, that are brought to sacrifice are decorated in painted tombs since the very beginning of uh, this uh, of their very big. Uh, the, the panther tomb, uh, of tomb, uh, tomb, tomb of Tarquinia of the end of the seventh century has this kind of, uh, of thing. And uh, uh, these heads were very popular in divination settings uh, in Ethiopia. I go quickly through uh, the representation of this uh, amphora where you have an idos. Uh, inspired by a severed head. Um, 
monster uh, severed. But we don't have only monsters. We do have uh, all kinds of heads uh, that are prophesying, talking heads, prophes prophesying heads. And they are, um, um, they are questioned by different kind of uh, uh, divination uh, vehicles. One is the idols, idos, the naked idols singing uh, Umaile, who is the Greek Eumelos, and Palamedes, Palamedes, um, who is the inventor of writing. And one of the ways um, the uh, Etruscan uh, took divination uh, was uh, through writing. And we have uh, many uh, mirrors uh, showing uh, severed heads, uh, talking heads, uh, uh, whose um, uh, prophecy was collected in different ways. So severed heads are very uh, important in document culture. Um, and another uh, important difference uh, is uh, with the um, uh, Greek representation of severed heads, who are also some way, in some way um, uh, listened to uh, by diviners. But these diviners uh, were the chrismologoi at the end of the 5th century BC uh, in Athens who were very badly considered. Uh, they were considered um, uh, not serious, uh, not serious, uh, they, 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 they weren't um, um, heard in, they were, they were politically uh, condemned. Uh, you can see here Apollon, uh, who is uh, kind of um, in his uh, arm, uh, he is uh, not, is refusing this kind of uh, divination. Instead, in the Etruscan, as we have seen, the Etruscan situation, it is a very good way of uh, uh, taking prophecies. So this is a complete different uh, use of the same image in a tool. So this is why we have to be careful in interpreting um, the Etruscan iconography with the uh, classical, classic arts. Uh, and severed heads uh, are all over. Uh, we have them in gems. Uh, we have uh, in gems of the fourth century, the third and second century. And there is a very interesting thesis, um, a theory of uh, Nancy, Nancy de Drummond, um, who is. Um, considering that the human bodies torn into parts were, were a means of uh, profit for the, uh, the Etruscans. So um, the, um, you see, the idea of violence is not the focus, not even for the, um, for the Etruscans. The important thing is the use of what uh, the, uh, severed heads, the bodies torn into parts uh, are uh, for the community. These are more, uh, more uh, mirrors. You see uh, another head popping over here. And of course, um, at the end of my in conclusion, I, I want to show you uh, how in the uh, tomb, tomb of uh, Volterra in Iran, late uh, Hellenistic, uh, the two twin brothers, Cassandra and Helenus, are depicted while they are killed, uh, before being killed by the Greeks uh, the, in, in Troy, the Achaeans in Troy. Uh, you have uh, here the two uh, twin brothers, uh, who represent uh, two different kinds of, of divination. The divination uh, close to shamanism, uh, represented by Cassandra, who was not believed ever, and uh, the divination, the technical divination, who is represented by her uh, brother, uh, Henry, the technical divination. So 
mm, the idea is always to represent, um, to, to focus uh, on divination. So as the, my final remarks are uh, at the beginning, uh, we have tried to explore why and what is the object of sacrificial ritual in classical words. Um, that, um, it, and it seems that uh, recent criticism uh, focused more on the ritual than on violence. Uh, which seems to be just a means of obtaining the attention of the supernatural powers. And uh, mm, I suspect that this new perspective uh, is probably going to fade away exactly as it happened uh, to theories presented 50 years ago. We never know this. But probably uh, from the methodological point of view, the best feature of this modern perspective is the context-oriented or approach, uh, both in the archaeological site, in, uh, in situations, um, uh, archaeological situation, but also uh, in sources, literary sources, and uh, iconography. Uh, so I think that um, what Simon said at the beginning, I hope to have satisfied <laughs> the, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. But well, late. So what I'm uh, one important thing I forgot to say is that we're not doing reception, but we invite you to the pub. So if anyone would like to continue the discussion after night, please say a few words. Could you? Would you like to raise your hand? Would anyone, because I think you need some numbers, or have you yes, already? That's have, you, right. have you booked? No. Uh, no. Yet. So, very quickly, anyone would like to discuss Etruscans in general, ritual, sacrifice, cultural relativism, any of these themes? Could you raise your hands quickly now? Because we will reserve a, a, a place in the pub. Anyone, would anyone like to join us? <laughs> so, one. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's say that. One, two, three, four, five. Let, let's see. Six, let's say seven or eight, eight people. Yeah, let's say people. Yeah, just one, two, three, four, ten people. Yeah, right, ten, ten people. So who's making the vote? Uh, Camila. Uh, Camila's going to do that, right, fine. And <laughs> <laughs> so I forgot that very crucial element of the game, <laughs> for which I forgot, um, apologize. Nigel, um, thank you so much for <laughs> the richness, the, the richness of cultural relativism, I think it's summarized here. The Etruscans are not a shadow of the Greeks and Romans, but I'm going to allow Nigel just to say a few words um, just um, in response. But do, do we have the opportunity for some discussion before we go to? Well, it, it, yeah. um, what I want, to, I know people are very conscious of time, um, but um, it, at a certain point, if you do need to leave, do, um, do just leave. But, um, I think there will be opportunity. Yes, but I, I've got questions to ask mm -hmm. Japan. Yeah, yeah. While we've got her here, I'm just going to nip <laughs> um, There will be people who want to know more about the archaeology of that site where there are 19 skeletons. Yeah. Because I remember being in Italy around about 2008 when these finds in Tarquinia were coming onto the front page of the newspaper. And the first reaction was one of shock. Sacrificia umana. Professor mm -hmm. Yatrovsky, and um, just th listening to Giovanna, I was thinking what it was that shocked people then. I think on one count it was a contradiction of a popular perception of the Etruscans as life-loving and, um, you know, a feel-good factor that you get from some of their artworks. Um, that, that does change over time, but the popular image of the Etruscans is that they were would not have been involved in human sacrifice. Then I think on a, on a second level, it would be from those who believe in classical civilization as being partly defined as its capacity for the sublimation of violence in several ways. One obvious way being organized athletics, which Conrad Lawrence, as you mentioned, it was a sort of conduit for aggression that it hurt people but on the whole it didn't cost them their lives um tragic drama where everything that was really nasty should not be visible on the stage 
that was an affront to your, um, your values there. And then something slightly more insidious, but I remember it being the case when um, people in the classical department were trying to incorporate the Phoenicians into the view of the ancient Mediterranean. And there was a persistent sort of anti-Semitic bias amongst archaeologists. And one of the grounds for that bias was that shock the Phoenicians sacrificed babies. Um, and you could point to certain sites, Phoenician sites like Taros, and identify you know, a place where this uh, horrific thing had taken place. So I think there were these were the reasons why the news of your discoveries was at first greeted with a certain amount of dismay. And compounded, as I think you mentioned, you know, neo-Pythagoreanism. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are people in the audience who are wondering what has Pythagoras with his theorem got to do with this? This was the same Pythagoras who stopped someone beating a dog because he said, I can hear my grandmother in that dog's mm -hmm. cries because he, he believed in reincarnation uh, that was uh, through the species. So humans could be reincarnated as animals, therefore animal sacrifice was bad and mm -hmm. you should be vegetarian. Um, and then, of course, Christian overlay of distaste for this as well. But then on second thoughts, you know, people who study the Etruscans would be aware that from Roman sources um, and also from other Italic sources, the Etruscans were credited, if that's the right word, or rather blamed, for in their funerary rituals, sowing the origins for gladiatorial combat. Mm -hmm. Um, as if the Romans were slightly ashamed of gladiatorial spectacle and those sort of fatal charades that they would stage in the amphitheatre where you know, you'd, you'd, you'd stage a, something like the plot of a Greek tragedy, except it would be happening for real, um, which most historians look at with great distaste. Um, but even with the gladiatorial spectacles, these were glossed by the Romans as a form of scapegoating. So, I mean, to put it crudely, the gladiators would have died according to the rules of the justice, but at least they were given a chance to, A, entertain people while they died, or possibly just a slender chance that they could escape the death penalty if they put it themselves well. Um, but the Romans made it very specific, this was something that had happened as a result of Etruscan funerary practices. And I think what you've done, Giovanna, is really forced us to confront the realities of that. And when we do see images on some of the Tarquinian tombs of some kind of, you know, with first two, um, there's some kind yes. of imagery of something that looks like it could be uh, a form of entertainment become capital punishment. Um, but I think you've given us a theoretical framework uh, and a vocabulary to sort of overcome this traditional, and in my view, entirely appropriate moral nausea in, in, <laughs> in approaching the subject mm -hmm. and face up to the reality that you have a sanctuary site with 19 skeletons. In it. What was happening there? And mm -hmm. I think this is what's. Uh, we are very cautious. We have yeah. to be very cautious. Yeah. Yes, yes. But I think you also, you show, you, as it were, you have to face that and, mm -hmm. and rationalize it in, yeah. in some way. Because um, we, there is a, a, the debate between ritual killing, homicide, sac human sacrifice. We are really very confused. The situation now in the scholarship, in our scholarship, is very confused. And I think that um, the, the, the important the only point of view that saves us is where these things happen. I mean, if you are in a sacred area, you are kind of helped, supported by uh, the, the, the complex. Yes, you've got that certain as it were. Yeah. Yeah. So it has to be something that yeah. has, yeah. That has to do supernatural. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And a divination that seemed like a, um, like a yeah. And I had, I had no time, but um, in our site, uh, 
we have a lot of uh, indication of uh, prophecy now. Uh, it, it, it is increasing. Um, the number of uh, indicators of uh, uh, divination that are, helps us to help us to to say this this site was for divination for for as a contact uh, as a point of contact with the with the gods. But could I ask, how do you? Perceive that is it because the hole in the earth is the, the hole in the earth? So that's one indicator. And then we have sortes now. Could you translate? Uh, sortes is uh, tokens right. uh, for divination, and um, and uh, lots of names of gods of god of, of Etruscan gods. And we have we have uh, an epileptic child. Uh, the epi epilepsy for the ancient world uh, was not a pathology, but it was a gift. It was Morbus Sacer. Yeah. So uh, we have this uh, boy, 80 year old, uh, who had symptoms of epilepsy for us, but uh, mm. he was exactly um, what we expect from a sh uh, sh sh shamanic sh procession. So he could not uh, walk properly, uh, he fell down, and he had hallucination. This is always from the medical, the pathologist. Uh, they could study his uh, skull and see those things. So this is quite important. We found him uh, by the cavity. And there is a, a legend, a, a sacred story, uh, of the foundation of the Etruscan religion, which is connected to Tarquinia, and the founder of Tarquinia, his name was Tarcon. Uh, while um, uh, plowing, uh, he made a boy born already old, coming spring, coming out from a, a, a clod, and this boy called Tages, he dictated him the norms of the Etruscan religion. So when we found this combination of a, of a cavity and a boy, uh, this happened in 1985, uh, we were um, struck, but we didn't say anything because it was too much. But recently uh, we found an inscription um, dating three centuries after, end of the 6th century, with an Etruscan word, terela, which, is, which means uh, in Latin prodigium, Greek teras. So it is something exceptional. So we could connect uh, this inscription to, because the inscription was found by this situation. This, this situation is kind of a monu monumentum because it's composed by the boy and the cavity. And so uh, it, we, kind of, uh, we had kind of telegram from antiquity <laughs> with this uh, inscription um, to show that we have uh, a memory of, of this fact that happened in the ninth century BC. So it, it, it was probably, a, a, we don't know if it is uh, the, 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 most, the principle from which the sacred story was uh, constructed, or if this situation is a repetition of the story. We, we will never know this. But the connection is, uh, with the inscription is really uh, strong. It's interesting, you had, a, you had an image from the Parthenon trees, which reminds me that um, you know, one interpretation that's been offered for the east part of the frieze, which is displayed in the British Museum as, you know, the sort of apex of stylistic perfection in terms of its, you know, classical technical um, aspect. Now, one, I think, quite plausible theory is that the story that is being depicted there mm -hmm. is a story of human sacrifice, the daughters of King Erechtheus being sacrificed in order to save the city of Athens, um, which was told in a, in a play by Euripides. So it was only, you know, Athenian tragic uh, repertoire. 
but then uh, one of the reasons that scholars don't like to contemplate that is because they can't bring themselves to accept that human sacrifice, even in legendary Greek mm -hmm. religious practice, was ever a part of Greek religious practice. So again, it's this, um, I think the, the instinctive repulsion of it is what makes it difficult for us to talk about. Yes. I have some other observations at this time, but are there any questions from the audience or comments or remarks? Or... Um, <clears throat> this may be very vague and feel free to, to not answer, but I was thinking with the idea of um, Romans taking some elements, um, more kind of ritual elements from the Juscan tradition before the Greek and human sacrifice in sacred spaces. So my question is, is there any, are there any thoughts that this might also be connected to the idea of human sacrifice within the foundation of Rome? As in Remus being, you know, it's it's not a ritual killing, but it is a killing that kind of, um, yes, it's it's kind of a christening of the site that yes. then. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yes, it's, it's a good point. So the beginning was, uh, was very, <laughs> the idea of um, of violence, of uh, murdering, of, of killing uh, is uh, is something that we have to to work out. It 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 is uh, capital punish. Is it capital punishment? Is it ritual killing? Is it homicide? Is it sacrifice? Human sacrifice. So these these are the big questions. And um, I think, uh, as I told uh, before, that the the place where this happens is is important. So the the foundation of Rome, the Etrusco Ritu, uh, is uh, something that we have to go to. Are there any other? Let's go ahead. No. I don't know, uh, it's uh, more of an archaeological question. Um, so are the 19 depositions um, respected by successive uh, structures in the site? Yes. Okay. I, yes, Okay. absolutely. Okay. And uh, um, there is a, a scholar, uh, a scholarship now that is coming out um, uh, about monumentum, monumentum from uh, the idea of uh, war, giving a war okay. uh, that is uh, important from, it's an important structure to explain all this uh, situation. So um, if you're, thank you for your question. Because <laughs> uh, as I, um, uh, talk to you about the boy and the inscription after three centuries, I can make a lot of examples in my site, in our site, because we have this bearer, the, the sea bearer. After two centuries, he had the stock of an anchor on top of him. So after two centuries, the other skeletons are always uh, indicated over time by different devices. It could be stone, it could be a smashed um, calcareous stone. Uh, the memory is very important in our site. So the memory of actions. So, uh, I was just going to end by saying that um, later in the term, we have Ian Armit coming to speak to talk about the contemporary head cutting yeah. north of the Alps. Mm -hmm. And also in the same period of the Iron Age, there is also substitution. So in, instead of a body, you have an amphora, which if you cut its head off, it produces a <laughs> suitable effect of a dying individual. So I think you have treasures in store because I think what has beautifully come out of Ivana's lecture is that in the classical world, we cannot accept one concept of violence. There are multiple interpretations. And when we add the barbarian world, we have a plethora of other interpretations as well. So I think we're in particularly 
not just from the lecture today, but in comparison what we have later in the term, I think we have some very exciting examples um, in store. So I urge you to, to come to Ian Ahmed's talk as well, and then we can continue this debate, because I think how do we interpret the material remains? Of course, in barbarian Europe, we don't have any textual sources, which I consider a complication, I must add. But, but I, I'd be slightly provocative, but it, it, you have to interpret directly from the material remains themselves. But I'd like to end by thanking Giovanna very, very much for, um, and she'll be here this whole term, and indeed there'll be other opportunities to meet her. We're going to give a talk. And we are um, going to have a, a workshop. Online. There'll be a workshop which develops a lot of the details of these themes. And if you're, you're interested, you know, just send me an email and you can come to it. And also, I think we're going to give a popular lecture on the Etruscans at some yes. stage. So yeah. if you want to hear more, more of the sort of colourful side of the Etruscans rather than that, mm -hmm. rather more strange habits, then um, do come <laughs> and listen to that as well. So I'd like to thank um, Joanna once again. Well, thank you.